We have a very special guest today, very special guest speaker. I want to tell you a little bit about him. He uh, received his ministerial studies diploma from World Harvest Bible College. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Ministry and Leadership from Ohio Christian University. He's a, he has a Master of Arts in Christian Leadership from Grand Canyon University. He's a former Ohio sectional director of the Spanish Eastern District. Serves as, he served as the Youth Alive Director for the Gulf Latin District. He served as Secretary and Youth Alive Director for the Texas Louisiana Hispanic District. He's a former youth and associate pastor serving in three different churches. Currently, he happens to be serving as our student ministries pastor, and our staff and our church are blessed, and he and his wife, Delia, have come to be with us, and they are a vital part of helping us move our student ministries to the next level. Would you give me a warm welcome this morning for Pastor Ruben Cuevas? How are you doing this morning? Are you blessed? favor of God on your life? Yes. Amen. I just want to take the opportunity to thank our pastors for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, God is good. Amen? Yes. Amen. This morning I want to talk to you from the subject, hello opportunity. Hello opportunity. I do want to put in a shameless plug. Uh, August 20th, we will be meeting all the parents uh, after the 1045 service in uh, the fellowship hall, me and my wife, we have a, we just want to meet you, share with you the vision, the, the calendars of upcoming year, and let you know what's going on in the youth ministry. And we also at 1045 uh, meet over there in the student building. My wife is actually probably preaching up a storm right now over there to the young people. So if there's any young people in here at 1045, we are in the student building. We want to we wanna meet you and, and just get to know you and be a part of your life. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. Hello, opportunity. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan in Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in, left in any men because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the word that you are going to give to your people, Father God. Speak through me, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When we see the book of Joshua... One of the things that we see very familiar in, the, in its topic is transition. And one of the things that happens in transition is that not everybody that starts with you will end with you. You have to be comfortable in the fact that there are many people who want to go with you, but there's probably not that many people who want to grow with you. As transition takes place in your life and as God begins to take you from where you are and to where he wants you to be, you will face some opportunities. You will face some doors that you will have to discern whether or not it is God. Isaiah 42 verse 9 says this, everything I've prophesied has come true. And now I will prophesy again. I will tell you the future before it happens. Here, here's, here's what God wants to do. He wants to tell us the future of our lives before it happens. Imagine the advantage of knowing the future uh, of, what you, of what your future looks like. It's amazing to me that God would begin to speak through us through dreams and visions and, and you talk to people all the time. I talk to young people all the time and I ask them, what is it that you want to be when you get a little bit older? What, 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 what's, what's, your, what's your career? What, what, what is it you, ever, you aspire to be? And I love hearing their answers. I love hearing, well, I want to be this. I want to be an engineer. I want to, I want to be a, a, a tech-savvy guy. I want, I want to do all of these different things, and they're great. And how many know that oftentimes when our future gets delayed, it's because we didn't pass the test in the present. Oftentimes we, we tend to forfeit what it is that's ahead of us because we mismanage what it is that's in front of us. We have to learn to keep the future at the forefront of our thoughts. 
And as we're working towards the end, as we're working and not getting caught up in what's happening around us, we have a picture of what our future looks like. How many of you know that if you had a picture of what your future looks like, what you're going through right now wouldn't even really matter? And the reason why it doesn't matter is it because it's just preparing you for what God has planned for your life. So therefore, I have the comfort, I have the peace, I have the joy, I have the understanding that what I'm going through right now, it's, it's, it's only temporary because God showed me what my future looks like. And if my present doesn't look what my future looks like, I know that there's some things that I'm still going to have to go through to get to my future. You see, this was the, the, uh, the tenacity of the life of Joseph. Joseph, uh, what made him what he was, it wasn't the trials, it wasn't the tribulations. What made Joseph not give up when he was sold into slavery, when he was thrown into a pit, when he was beaten by his brothers, when he was lied about by his boss's wife, when, when he was thrown into the jail? What made Joseph not give in was the fact that he had a clear picture of what his future looked like. It's easy, to not, it's easy to not get caught up in the trials and the circumstances of life when you have a clear vision of what your future looks like. So we have to understand that God has this amazing plan, his amazing future for our lives, and what he says will come to pass. How many believe that this morning? What he says will come to pass. So when we see the book of Joshua and we, we read Joshua chapter 1, and I want to encourage you to read that in your own time, There's a couple things that we find in Joshua chapter 1 that leads us to where we are in Joshua chapter number 2. In Joshua chapter 1, we find that Joshua was commissioned to possess the land. Also, we find that Joshua had had transitioned uh, to lead the charge. And lastly, we find that Joshua trailblazed a path for the team to take their place. So when understanding transition and understanding the opportunity that comes with it, understand that there are some things in your life that you're going to trailblaze through. When my life is being transitioned and God has taken me from, from where I am to where he wants me to be, doors of opportunity are going to be there. But you have to ask, is it the right door? What it takes for you to walk through that door is called faith. The Bible is very clear when it, when it talks about faith. Romans 1.17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, that the just shall live by faith. So when you're born again, when, when, you, when you've given your life to Jesus, you were justified by God, which now causes you to walk by faith. That a believer who is just must live their life in faith. In other words, I I will live my life to what is written in the word of God. So it's not what others are telling me. It's, It's not what's going on around me. The Bible is clear and it says that the just shall live by faith. So now I'm required as a believer to live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 says, 7 says this, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So when you were in the world, you were moved by the lust of your eyes. What caused you to start sinning was what you saw. So therefore, life, pre-salvation, was driven by what you see. If you saw something, it worried you. If you saw something nice, you turned your head ten times. You were driven by what you saw. But the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. If I'm the faith, if I'm the just, and I live by faith, that means I walk by faith and not by sight. So therefore, I'm disqualified as a believer to be, uh, to be persuaded by what I see. I have to be persuaded by what I hear. Faith comes by hearing, so if I hear it, And it's faith, I as a believer are required and qualified to walk by it. I can't walk by what I see anymore. That's that's when I was a sinner. That's, That's when I was in the world. That's when I was lost. Now you can walk by faith. Let let, let me break it to you down this way. 
there's going to come there's going to come times in your life where storms trials and situations are going to come and those things are going to bring fear anxiety and worry and what happens is that when you're stuck in a storm you're not persuaded by what you see because you know that the God you serve is in the middle of the storm so I'm not persuaded by what I see I'm not moved by what's around me why because we don't live that way anymore I don't live by what I see, I live by what I hear. I heard that if God is for me, then who can be against me? I've heard that greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. I'm persuaded by what I've heard, not necessarily qualified to live by what I see. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It doesn't say faith is the substance. It says now faith. Somebody say now faith. Now for lack of understanding, the church has mistakenly called faith hope. And hope is not faith. Hope has everything to do with your future. I hope I get a car. Future. I hope I get the job. Future. I hope things turn around, future. So if I live by faith, I live for the now. And I can hope for the future. So faith drives hope. It shouldn't be hope driving my faith. And the reason why we get so frustrated is because we've hoped and hoped and hoped, but we didn't have faith. You see, God doesn't move by hope. He moves by faith. He said, what moves me is your faith. What, what gets my attention is, is your faith. So faith turns into substance that eventually brings the evidence. Hebrews 11, 1, for now is, is uh, for faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith produces substance that eventually brings the evidence. Now evidence, I'm going somewhere, now evidence comes by substance that is birthed by faith. Faith creates substance that eventually brings evidence. So if I have faith now, somebody say now, I'm going to buy me a car. I have faith to buy me a car, then my faith that is now is going to lead me to some substance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start saving some money. Which means a few months later, I, I've, I've decided to have faith for the now, which was then. I've got the substance in my hands. I've got the cash in my hands. I'm going to go to the car dealership. I'm going to give them my substance. Next thing you know, they're going to exchange it and give me the evidence. So I have my car, which is the evidence. But I needed to have the substance, but the way that I got the substance is I had to have faith for it. So you have to have faith that produces substance. So the Bible says that we walk by faith. So faith doesn't come by standing still. We have to walk in it. Faith becomes substance when you begin to move toward the evidence that you're wanting for your life. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, And since we were the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. So the Bible talks about Joshua. Joshua was a man throughout all of Scripture. He would, he would see it and then he would say it. Three things I want to share with you briefly from our, our portion of Scripture that we find here. Number one is this, faith demands decisions. Faith demands decisions. Joshua 2, 1 through 3 says this. And Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly to Shittimum and spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lounged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho went to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who've come to you and entered your house. For they have come to search out all of the land. 
It's amazing that Joshua sent two men to spy out the land, just as Moses did as he sent Joshua out and 11 other men. Numbers 13, 1 through 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I've given to the people of Israel from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, every one a chief among them. I want you to understand something about what's going on. Joshua has already been there. Him and the other men, him and Caleb, came back and they began to talk to Moses and they said, we can do it. We, we, we can possess the land. Two of them said that they could do it. The other ten said that they can't. You see, Joshua, when he went, went to go search out the land, at that time, he was an assistant. Now, the roles have been reversed. He's no longer assistant. He's now the man in charge. He sent two guys out to spy the land. Why would you send two people to see what it is that you already seen? Simple. When doors of opportunity are in front of you, it's imperative to get other people to see what it is that you already saw. The greatest mistake that you'll ever make is when you decide without discussing. Husbands, we, 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 we've been there, right? We're, we're going to do something, and you, you get the look from your wife. You know what I'm talking about, husbands? First, okay. We've been there. We decide without discussing. Great leaders discuss before they decide. Most people discuss, most people decide before discussing. You see, one of the greatest advisors I have in my life is my wife. She's phenomenal. I discuss everything with her. But I also understand that there are some emotional ties that are attached to whatever it is, what door that is in front of our lives. I, I, I like to get people who have no emotional attachment to what it is that the doors that are facing in my life. Those are the people that are going to give me a solid answer. You see, Joseph under, Joshua understood how important this really was. You see, when him and Caleb came back and they gave the correct report, the other ten people gave the wrong report. Understand that not everybody was on board with Moses. The purpose of vision is to get everybody on board. How do you get everyone on board? When you begin to open up the door to the things that you've already seen and allow others to see it before you walk into it. Every one of us in here has blind spots in our lives. And it's important that we bring others on board to spy it out. You see, decisions will either affect you or infect you. Most of the time when we decide before we discuss, the decisions infect us instead of affect us. Number two, faith demands dedication. Faith demands dedication. Joshua chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says this, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. These men came to her and she said to them, she knew exactly who these guys were. You are the guys whose God opened up the Red Sea and you were able to walk across on dry ground. You are the guys who, who God provided quail for you to eat when you began to get tired of bread. You, you are the guys where God told your leader to strike a rock in the middle of the desert and water began to come out. They heard all about the miracles that their God did. They show up, and the Bible says that they were in fear. Why were they in fear? Because they realized that these men were, were, were dedicated and committed to a God who was just as committed and dedicated to them as well. When the prostitute uh, 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 saw these guys, she could have sold them out. She could have waved the flag and said, they're over here. She could, have, she could have told the king that they were here, but well, watch this. She saw them, and she saw a God in them that she didn't even see in her own king. And that's why she decided that these were the guys that I'm going to do whatever I can to be around. When you're committed, church, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
And when you're committed to the cause of Jesus Christ, people in your family, people in your work environment, people around you will be interested in whom the God in which we serve. Because everything that we say about our God is good. Number three, the last one. Faith demands demonstration. Faith demands demonstration. Joshua chapter 2, verse 14 through, eight, 14 through 19. And the men said to her, Our life is yours to even death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And then she let them down by a rope through the windows of her house. Uh, her house was built in a city wall so that she lived within the wall. <clears throat> and she said to them, Go into the hills. Our pursuers will, enc will encounter you. And hide there for three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will go guiltless and respect to the oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, we shall, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window. Though it through it will let us down and we shall gather into your house, your father, your mother, your brothers, and all of your father's household. Then if anyone goes to the doors of your house in the street, his blood shall be on his own head. And, and we shall be guiltless. But if, a man, but if a hand is laid upon anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. I want you to see something so consistent in Scripture. I want you to see the detail of what it is that's being said. They said, ma'am, I, I, I want you to take this scarlet robe. I, I, I want you to take it and I want you to tie it around, around the window and let us down. We're going to leave, but when we come back, make sure your whole entire family is in the house, and they will be spared. Why? Why will they be spared? What is significant of the scarlet red robe? The scarlet red robe symbolizes the hope of redemption. Rope comes from the Hebrew word. I know Pastor Bruce gave you Greek. I'm going to give you a little bit of Hebrew, okay? Okay. You're going to walk out here speaking tongues, English, Hebrew, Greek. You're getting it all today, okay? So rope comes from the Hebrew word for hope. And the scarlet represents the redeeming power of the blood. I want you to see the consistency of God throughout the Bible. Exodus chapter 12 verse 7 says this, Then that shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorsteps. And the, lint, and the lintel of the houses in which they will eat. God told the children of Israel, he says, I, I want you to get the blood of the lamb and paint it over your doorpost. Because a door is where people walk in and people walk out. But I want you to cover it with the blood because when you do, I will know that this home carries the hope of redemption. You fast forward to the children of Israel who sent the spies into Jericho and into the promised land. This prostitute hides them. And she asks if her family can be saved, and they say, yes, tie a scarlet rope around the window. A window is an avenue in which someone can climb in or climb out. And when she tied it uh, to the window, this house was known as the hope of redemption. You fast forward to the New Testament and you see where Jesus died on the cross for our sins. His blood cleansed our hearts. Our hearts are a medium in which things come in and things come out. And when you have the blood applied to your heart, it signifies that this heart where the Holy Spirit dwells is the hope of redemption. Everything is attached to whether or your life is anchored on the hope of redemption. I want you to understand, church, that opportunities will come your way. And you would have thought that the very one that would have saved these men looked look nothing like them. God used a prostitute to hide these men and to be used for the fulfillment of their destiny. When opportunities come your way, somebody say, my way. My way. Don't live by sight. Because when you do, you just might miss who comes into your life. You see, oftentimes we discount people 
who don't look like us, who don't act like us, but God has assigned them to each and every one of us. Recently, I was watching a YouTube video about a billionaire who wanted to make some changes in his company. He has a vision for where his company was going, and, and instead of going to Ivy League colleges, he goes to his management and he says, he says, I, I want you to give me a few days while, 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 I, while I do something. I'm going to search for people who we need in order to take this company to the next level. He went to the thrift store. He went to buy some clothes, and after he buys the clothes, he puts them on. He goes into the pool, jumps into the pool, comes out of the pool, rolls around in some dirt, messes up his hair. He gets a cardboard sign that says, we'll work for food. He, he waits patiently for people to hand him money. Cars and cars continue to go by. The first car that stops is kind of broken down a little bit. Had those windows that you kind of had to turn, not, not the electric ones. Didn't have electric windows. This man in the car gives him a handful of change. The billionaire, with his empty hand, reaches into his pocket and gives him a $100 bill. The man in the car was shocked and startled, and the billionaire asked him, he says, would, would you mind going over to that gas station right down the street? I have a team of people who want to talk to you. Another come, car comes by, and it's barely, barely going. The bumper is half off, and he does the same thing. He gives the billionaire a, a dollar bill. The billionaire does the same thing, gives him $100 bills, and tells him the exact same thing. He says, would you go over there? I've got some people that want to talk to you. Ten people have finally come and actually given the billionaire what they had. He looks at each of them and he says, do you have the life that you've ever dreamed? Do you want to make a lot of money? All of them responded, yes. He says, I'm going to hire you. The next day he gets them all dressed up and he brings them into the office. He shows his management team, these are the ten people. And he tells them, these are the ones that will take our company to the next level. They have compassion for people who don't look like them, that don't talk like them, that don't act like them. They have compassion. And the customers that we re need to reach that will take our company to the next level don't talk like us, don't look like us, or act like us. I believe that the reason God chose you, there are people that God wants you to reach. And he says, you look like them, you talk like them, and act like them. You were once just them. But if I clean you up and I change some things around in your life, I will use you to reach those people for Jesus Christ. I will choose you to be the salt and light in our community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open up our eyes to see where it is that you would lead us, God. Awaken our ears so that we would begin to hear the voice guiding us. Lord, I ask that you would inspire our minds to comprehend your love for each and every one of us. Soften our hearts, God, that we may be able to offer grace that is needed to all those that we meet. Lord, I pray that you would begin to watch our feet so that we would tread upon your kingdom path. Guard our heart from selfishness that we will be able to give freely. Inspire the words that we speak, that we would bring hope and healing to each and every one that we meet. In your mighty, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.